All right, we're going to continue talking about centroids and centers of mass and also talk about a very important theorem that's directly related to the idea of the center of mass um, and very, very useful theorem. Let's start by finding the centroid of a thin plate. Centroid, recall, means the density is constant. Where it's the center of mass, but the density is constant. And imagine we have a thin plate made up of one arc of the sine function between zero and pi. Now, if the density is constant, one thing that is kind of nice is you can use your intuition. If you're trying to find the balancing point of this thin plate, by symmetry of our sine graph, we would know that the x coordinate of our centroid would have to lie right on the middle, right here at x equals pi over 2, right? This would be pi over 2. So we know x bar is going to be pi over 2 because our density is constant. And that is allowed. That's fair game. You don't have to rederive something that is plainly obvious, that's intuitive. But we do, don't know what y bar would be. How high would the center of mass be at, uh, along pi over 2? So we have to derive that again. Um, we have our formulas. We call mass is density times area. So we're going to have to integrate delta times, for the area, you can imagine just using vertical cross sections throughout this region. Every vertical cross section we put in here hits sine on the bottom, zero on the, sine on the top, zero on the bottom. So sine of x is the height, dx is the width. If you integrate from zero to pi, we get two delta. On the previous video, we talked about an alternate formula for m sub x, uh, the moment about the x-axis, because if you use the natural definition for moment about the x-axis, you would need to be using horizontal cross sections, points that are equal distant to the x-axis. We don't want to do that. For obvious reasons, we're going to be, our width of our horizontal cross section is going to be bounded by the same function. So the alternate formula allows us to stick with vertical cross sections. Recall the formula was 1 half delta f of x squared minus g of x squared, where f of x was the top function, 0 was the bottom function. g was the bottom function, so that will be 0. So we have to integrate basically sine squared from 0 to pi. Uh, recall to integrate sine squared of x, you need to use an identity. And it's not the Pythagorean identity that we're used to seeing so often. It's the uh, 1 half times 1 minus cosine of 2x is equal to sine squared of x. So we replace that. We can pull out the 1 half, get a 1 fourth. The integral of 1 is x. Integral of cosine of 2x is 1 half sine of 2x. And if you plug in from pi to 0, we get one-fourth delta times pi. And we can now find y bar is the moment about the x-axis divided by the mass. So I've got one-fourth pi delta divided by two delta. Deltas cancel, and I get pi over eight. My center of mass is pi over two, comma, pi over eight. Okay. So let's take this same arc of sine of x and I'm going to show you something really cool involving the center of mass, but let's first do something like kind of a review problem. We've done this before. Let's take, make a solid by taking the first arc of sine and revolving it around the x-axis and trying to find the volume of that. So this would be a good disk method um, problem. Your disk, remember the formula is pi times the radius squared in this case, times dx, since we're using vertical disks. The radius is just the distance from the x-axis to your function, so it's sine squared x. We talked about how to integrate sine squared x using the identity. In fact, this is exactly the same. Um, and when all is said and done and you evaluate it from pi to zero, we get pi squared over 2 as our volume. So now that we know that, let's talk about there is another way to get the volume of that solid using the centroid, using the center of mass. And this is called Pappus, Pappus's theorem. 
And what Pappus realized about the center of mass, let me move this up here, so we're gonna do the same problem, is that you can think of the center of mass, um, well, I've described it already on a previous video, as all of the area lies on the center of mass. When you balance an object, when you balance an object on its center of mass, got my phone here, it, when you get it on its center of mass, it, it, it balances perfectly just at one point. Maybe a pen would be better. <laughs> when you balance it on its center of mass, I can find it. It's as if all of the mass is acting right over that one point on my finger here. So all of the area is acting there. Okay, and so what Pappas realized is we could get the solid by thinking of all the area condensed right at the centroid, and as we rotate the sine arc graph around the x-axis, you could pretend all of that area is sweeping out a circle where the radius is, in this case, y bar, right? The radius would be pi over eight. And so what Pappas realized is if we just take the area of our cross section, the area of sine of x, multiply it by the distance traveled by the centroid, which could either be, remember distance would be, it would be a circle. The perimeter of a circle is two pi times the radius. So it could be two pi x bar, or in this case, y bar, right? And lo and behold, if you do this formula, the area of our cross section, uh, we did that when we did the mass earlier, the area of one arc of sine of x from zero to pi comes out to be two. And then I multiply that by two pi, time, pi times y bar, which is pi over eight. That gives me four pi squared over eight, which simplifies to pi squared over two. Let me move this back up, which is exactly the same answer we had using the disk method. Pretty cool, right? It does require you to know the centroid, you know, ahead of time, but once you know that, it makes those, that calculation a lot easier. Another way to think of the centroid is, in, you know, an alternative way in terms of thinking of all the area focus there. You could think of the centroid, the distance traveled by the centroid is like the average distance traveled by all the points in the region. So, right, if I have a point here and I revolve this around the x-axis, it's not gonna travel around a very big circle, right? If I choose a point up a little higher, that's gonna travel around a bigger circle, right? As it goes around the x-axis. So you can think of the centroid as the average distance traveled by every single point in the region. And so if we multiply that by the area of the region, that gives us the volume as well. So what if I took that region and revolved it around the x-axis? Sine of x spun around the x-axis. Um, Good review here. You'd definitely want to use vertical cross sections if you were doing this um, as we did earlier. And if you revolve that around the y axis, you're going to sweep out a shell. So this would be a good time to use the shell method. Recall the shell method was 2 pi times the shell radius, which is x, times the shell height, which would be sine of x. Now the trouble is, that's the correct formula for the volume, but we have not discussed how to integrate x times sine of x yet. That's something we're gonna learn in chapter eight, okay? And when we do learn it, you could absolutely integrate this and find the volume. But since we know the center of mass, because we worked it out, is pi over two pi over eight, Pappus would say, the volume is the area of our region times the distance traveled by the centroid. The area of the region is again two. The centroid's gonna travel around a circle, so it's gonna be the circumference of this circle when the formula for circumference is two pi r. What would the radius of this circle be? It would be x bar this time. So 
2 pi times x bar, multiply that all out, gives me 2 pi squared would be the volume of that solid. Pretty cool. You can also use Pappas's theorem um, in other contexts too. It's not just volume. Let's go back to fluid force. Let's say we had a thin rectangular plate, two feet by four feet, that was sunk 10 feet underwater. And we want to find the total fluid force acting on that plate. Well, back when we were working on fluid force, what we would want to consider is horizontal cross sections, because those points are at the same depth. Our formula for fluid force was the density of water times depth times the area of our thin horizontal cross section. I left density as delta, you know, if it's water, you can put 62.4, but whatever it is, right, whatever fluid it is. Um, I did use a different coordinate system than I sometimes do. I let y equals zero be the bottom and measure y upward, which means the distance, the depth of this uh, horizontal strip would actually be 10 minus y. And the area of this thin strip would be four feet long times the thickness, which is dy. And if you integrate this all out from zero to two, because that's how far you'd have to go for y, uh, you end up getting 72 delta. Okay. Now, what would Pappas, how would Pappas have viewed this problem? Pappas would have thought about it this way, is that again, all of the area of this plate can be thought of as acting at the centroid. And for a rectangle, right, if it's four feet by two feet, where would the centroid be? It'd be right in the middle. We don't really need X bar, but it'd be two feet over and one foot up, right? It'd be right in the middle, which means the centroid would be nine feet from the surface of the water. And using your same definition of fluid force, density times de depth times area, density, it would be the depth of the centroid, which is nine feet. And instead of doing individual areas of horizontal strips, we would multiply that by the entire area of the rectangle because we're pretending it's adding, acting right at the centroid, which is two feet by eight feet, eight square feet. Notice we get the same answer, 72 delta. No integral required. So now if you get a fluid force question, if you know the centroid, if it's a rectangle or maybe a circle where you know the centroid's at the middle, you now have this as an option rather than setting up an integral to find the fluid force. So it's a really handy tool. One other problem you could, Pappas could help you with, surface area. Let's say we took the circle x minus two squared plus y squared equals one. That would be a circle centered at two zero on the x-axis with a radius of one and revolve that around the y-axis to get a shape that's going to resemble either a bagel or a donut. Okay, I can't draw the whole thing. This is like a slice of it. But hopefully you can picture like a bagel coming around the y-axis here. And uh, that's also referred to as a torus. When you revolve a circle, we call that a torus. We want the surface area of that torus. Okay. So. How will we do this? Our general definition for surface area is the length of the arc. And the way Pappas would have thought about it is the distance traveled by the centroid. So if by the length of the arc, we're talking about the perimeter of our circle, the circumference of the circle, which would be two pi times the radius, which would be one. That's this length. And then we're gonna multiply that by the distance traveled by the centroid. Well, where's the centroid of that circle? It's right in the middle at two zero. So the centroid would travel around a circle of radius two. So the distance traveled by the centroid is two pi times two. Multiply both of those together and we get the surface area to be eight pi squared. Very easy, especially if you consider how difficult it would be to set that up with an integral. So uh, 
There you go. That's Pappas's theorem. Keep that in mind as you work through some of these problems. <laughs>